Poor Man's Champagne, also known as sparkling white grape wine. Okay, we don't make a lot of white grape. It took me three tries to get that. That's why she's laughing. We don't make a lot of white grape stuff on the show, and there's a good reason. A lot of the time, if you see a white grape juice, it's actually not even pure white grapes. Now, you can make white wine just using whole grapes. I know that, but this is meant to be something simple. I mean, you don't call it poor man's champagne and then use like all kinds of crazy stuff, right? So we found Publix has just a basic 100% white grape juice. The other reason we don't use a lot of white grape is because they almost always have preservatives, and this is no exception. This one is filtered water, grape juice concentrate, grape juice, citric acid, ascorbic acid, potassium metabisulfite. So it does have sulfites present probably to keep the color. That's where this cooking pot comes into play. Yes, because we're gonna test a theory that you can cook the sulfites out of the juice. I don't know, I'm gonna try it. And I know that sometimes there's not a lot in there, but they have to declare it. So if there's not much, we might be able to overpower it with yeast anyway, but hey, you know what? It's worth a try and it's something different. Plus, we're gonna do another concentrated juice. In other words, we're not gonna add sugar to this. So we have three half gallons of the white grape juice and I don't need to splash pour it because there's no reason to. I'm dumping them into a pot. I think that's my favorite part of the whole show, throwing bottles and then making that sound. Whoa, splashy. Splashy McSplasherton. Now each of these is a half gallon for reasons. But we only intend to make one gallon, so why are we putting more than one gallon in this pot? Well, because we're gonna cook it, and That's it's right. gonna condense it and make it less than the volume it is now. That was really loud. So yeah, we're gonna put this on the stove, we're gonna bring it up to basically to a simmer, like a, a boil, and we're gonna cook it down to about two thirds. That's gonna concentrate all those sugars, concentrate the flavors too, just like we did in the concentrated apple wine, and it might alter the color. We're not sure yet. This was like a light-ish brown, so it might not be a white wine, it might be a brown wine. I don't know yet, <laughs> but we'll find out. And once that's done, we'll be back to show you. Okay, so we boiled the heck out of this until it got down to a much lower volume. Then we poured it into a pitcher, cooled it in the sink, and here we are. Yeah, okay, so we jokingly call Brian the volumizer. He just eyeballed, oh, I think it's about a gallon now. It's at 125 it's of 128 like, ounces. What, it's fun. I, I, like, I live with this man. I like doing stuff like that. <laughs> But what we wanna do is we're gonna take a pH reading of this liquid now, because any acid that might've been in there before, there's gonna be more now because we concentrated it. So I wanna see where it's at for acid. And it's a good thing we checked. This is sitting at like 2.5. Well, guess what? That's gonna alter our plans a little bit, but I wanna see how this tastes. Oh, that's really good. There's a few ways that you can change the pH. One of them is you can add just plain old baking soda. Now. Baking soda is going to eventually give a little bit of a salty flavor. So while you can use that, we may need to add an exorbitant amount. So, so we have potassium bicarbonate, which you can get easily from Amazon. I don't normally like to have to add things like this, but you know what? When it's too acidic, it will not ferment. This is below the recommended range. We want to be at four or above. So I'm going to have to add a couple of teaspoons of potassium bicarbonate. We'll be right back with that. Okay, I'm sure there's calculators somewhere online that'll tell you how much of this stuff to add to this to get the pH to change. I'm gonna show you a really super simple way that does not require a lot of extra gear or calculations. I'm gonna take a teaspoon of it, full teaspoon, drop it in. Ta -da! Yeah, you'll get a little bit of a reaction. It's kind of like when you add um, vinegar. To coke. Nope, nope, that's different. That's, that's different. nucleation sites. Oh, that's nucleation. This is actually if you take vinegar and baking soda and mix them together. Same uh -huh. concept. Because you have an acidic thing with a basic thing or an alkaline thing. So when they mix, they create gas. So is the Mentos thing actually nucleation sites and the acid reaction? It's, nu it's nucleation sites and the aspartame, the, the fake sugar that they use. Right, I was just wondering if the, the covering, the, the binder of the Mentos it, might be. I don't think it had anything to do with acidity. Okay. I don't know, it's been a while since Oops, I saw acidic. that. That's why I was just wondering. Oh uh, yeah, it's been a while since I saw that Mythbusters episode. 
But I think it is primarily in the manipulation side. So yeah. I just didn't yeah. know if it would be a component. By the way, these pH strips that I'm using, they come in a roll. It's in its own little plastic container and it's got the chart right on it. I love these things. So much easier than any other method that we have tried. Where's my, there it is. I sanitized it. I just need a couple drops. Wow. It is better, but not by a lot. Another teaspoon. Might even need like three or four. Why don't we just put two in there for now? I'm gonna do two more because right. Derek has suggested two more. Here's the thing. It's gonna be really hard for us to go too high at this point because it's gonna take an inordinate amount of this to get it way too high. So two more, that'll work. Just remember how many I put in so that we it's can three. notes. Three. One, two. Whoa. Whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. Just, 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 nobody move. Don't breathe. We almost had an overflow. That's amazing. See, we should learn from the science experiments of our youth. We are, we're creating a volcano. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that was not expected. I saw a little bit of bubbling. I'm like, oh, it's fine. It's fine. And then it get bigger. Do not fear the foam unless it's going to overflow all over your kitchen. <laughs> By the way, this does really have a lovely color, and I think it'll keep a lot of that color as it goes. Okay, so let's hit it again. Ooh. Getting in the zone. It's, um, Perfection. it's there. 4.0. All right, so that was three teaspoons. Three teaspoons of potassium bicarb. I mean, I, you guys can probably see this from here. Look at the difference in color, just like that. And that's why I love using the pH strips. We've used meters and things like that. Honestly, old school just works sometimes. Super quick, super easy. And now it's out of the way. Could we go a little higher? Yeah, actually, I think we should. Here's why. As this ferments, it's probably gonna become more acidic. And I know we're gonna be adding some tea to this. So I think I'll just do another teaspoon. It's probably okay. not gonna change it a lot, but make it four teaspoons. Four teaspoons. I also suggest doing it the way we did, where you only add a little bit at a time because... The foam, the for foam. one thing. <laughs> so do like one, add another one, whoa. whoa. And, nope. do, and don't stir it so vigorously, perhaps, at, initially. I never do anything halfway. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever noticed that. <laughs> Someone's gonna ask me if you can carbonate your wine this way. I don't think so. One more check. And I love this dispenser because it's literally like tape. You just put out a little bit, snap it down and you get as much as you want. I got too much that time. That's darker green. That tastes really good. Well, that's good. It's, uh, oh, we're probably closer to five pH now, which is even better. Here's what'll happen. As this starts to ferment, it does become a little bit more acidic. So if we started out too close to the ideal or the low end of ideal, then it could dip down and it could stall. But because we started a little higher, now when it dips down, it'll still be in the safe range. All right, do you want to add your tea to here before adding that No, to I'm gonna here? add the tea to this. You're gonna add the tea to this and then put that on top? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So what she's talking about is we're gonna start adding stuff to our fermenter, okay? So what, what do we end up with for our volume of tea? Uh, we have just a little under a cup, six ounces. The thing about adding tea, tea adds tannins, and it's just that quality that we're going after because we're using juice. There's no stems, there's no seeds, there's no skins, there's nothing to add that mouthfeel to it. So it would taste kind of odd. It just wouldn't, wouldn't taste quite right. So we are using black tea. The brand doesn't matter as long as it's black tea. If you use a flavored tea, you can, but it's not going to taste the same. You're going to add that flavor to your brew. Whereas this does not taste like black tea when it's done. Okay. There's just not much here. But the thing that's important is it's one tea bag. You can use half a gallon of water if you want to, but it's one tea bag because it's getting dispersed through a whole gallon. So it really doesn't even matter. But I'm going to put this in first. We steeped it for four minutes this time, and it's come to full room temperature. It's cooled off. All right, now I'm gonna add this. And I know that these containers are a little over a gallon, so we should actually be okay. And in the beginning, it's good to get some air in there. So that's why I can do the rough pour and it's all good. Don't even worry about it but you do want your funnel like off center a little bit. Otherwise you can create an airlock and it 
will bubble over and give you fits. All right, so what I want to do now, though, is I do want to get a little bit more air into this. So if I could have a bung, please. All right, and to shake it up, I like to use my thumb saver bung. Thumb saver! By the way, everything that we're using has been sanitized in. The red the red sanitization! sanitization. Except for the pot that we put the juice in, because it didn't need to be. It was pasteurized. It was boiling. <laughs> yeah, I literally boiled it, so it's pasteurized. The juice itself was sterile coming out of the containers, but sitting and, in the open air and, and boiling and it, it was boiled. Then we boiled it. So it's it's super sanitary now. All right, see how that color changes when you add some air? In the beginning phases, yeast like to have whoa! It's warm. <laughs> Yeast like to have some oxygen so that they can build up a colony. That's what they need. Once the oxygen is gone, that's when they get to work on the sugars and start fermenting. I think I just took away at least two of Derek's lives. I know, it's a good thing I'm feline. Going to run into a spatial issue. Yep. We should have put this in a bucket. We have a new fermenter that oh, yeah. we haven't tried out yet. Let's, uh, let's go get that and give it a shot. So in our never ending quest for 1.3 gallon or five liter fermenters, we came across this one from North Mountain and they're available on Amazon right now. I can't guarantee if they'll be available in a week, but they are available. And that leads me to a good point. All the equipment that we're using, all the ingredients, everything that you need to know will be linked in the description below. We're gonna extra aerate. So I need you to balance this guy. No, 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 we're putting this in first. first. Okay. Yeah. One thing at a time. All right. All right. Look at that. Barely, it's like halfway. So the reason why I like these fermenters is A, that is so pretty. It's such a nice looking fermenter. It's super heavy glass, by the way. Really, really thick. It uses a standard bung and airlock too, which is very cool. No modifications necessary but it's a little bit bigger than a one gallon. So we have slightly more than a gallon here with foam. So that means when we rack this, we'll end up with like a gallon. The only downside is it is a narrow mouth, so you really don't wanna put any solids or anything into this. A word about headspace in primary. It doesn't really matter. This much headspace, not a problem at all in primary fermentation because this is gonna get filled up with gases, they're gonna get pushed out the airlock, not a problem. It's not till later that too much headspace is an issue. Okay, so now that we have it in our fermenter, I wanna take a reading on this. And by a reading, I mean a specific gravity reading, and this will be our original gravity. So I got my baster that just reaches in there. Oh, just barely. If you wanted to use a refractometer at this point, you totally can, no, no adjustments even necessary. Just take the reading right off of it and it'll be fine. I'm expecting a 1.075 to 1.090 because I'm expecting that the juice was a 1050 to 1070, 1060 or so. So 1.5 times that should be right in there. Uh, let's see. Oh, it's a little bit more. Looks like 1.096. And if I look to find out what approximately the potential alcohol on that is, looks like 11, 12, eh, about 13% or so ABV, which is beautiful. That means this should go dry, which is perfect for what we have in plan for it. In plan? In store. Planned for it. Yeah. Ah, words. Well, some of you might be confused and say, hey guys, you're supposed to be making champagne. Why are you not using a champagne yeast? Good question, and we will answer that later on in this video. Wow, there's some foreshadowing for you. So our yeast that we're gonna be using is 71B. And the reason I'm using it is because it goes to 14 or 15%, like I just said, but it also preserves fruity flavors. And in our particular environment, in our house, which we keep between 72 to 75 or 76 degrees Fahrenheit, I'll put the Celsius right here, it seems to work beautifully well. We've had enormous success with 71B. So I'm gonna put in half a packet that's right, back to frugal people, half a packet. I kind of like that old rule that I used to have. If you're doing up to three gallons, use a half packet. Anything over three gallons, use a whole packet. That works really, really well. We had in our comments recently, somebody say, well, you did things this way one time and you did the things this way a different time, which one's right? 
The answer is they're both right, because in brewing, like in most things in life, there's more than one ways to come across, come at a problem. Oh yeah. And here's the thing too. If you look at some of our older videos, we did things a certain way. And then as we progressed, we did things a different way because we learned, we grew, we, we expanded, you know, that's the whole point of, uh, a hobby, right? And, and experimentation to, to do things better the next time than you did the first time. All right, so that's in there. Now that's the thing. That's the thing, all right. Next up, airlock and a bung goes in. Looks like it's gonna hold. It's staying, yay. All right, so what are we gonna do with this now? We're gonna let it sit. I would normally say put it on a cookie sheet with edges so that way in case it- I think we still should. We still should? Yes. Okay. There's not a lot of- That's, uh, that's just, true, it is very- Yeah, narrow, it so. looks like there's a lot of space, but that'll fill up really fast if it starts foaming. It's always a good idea to just put it on a lip tray, that way you don't make a mess. It's no big deal, you can take it up, take it off the tray tomorrow, but today, put it on the tray. The reason why we're saying that is that the yeast, now that they're in there, they're gonna start fermentation. And part of that process is they're going to off gas. So at the very beginning, when they're super excited because this is still nice and warm, oh, yeah. they're gonna create foam and more foam and more foam and more foam, and it could foam over. So if you put it on a tray with edges, that tray will catch the foam mess rather than having it dispersed all over your kitchen. Exactly, now a word about the yeast and starting up. It can take up to about three days for it to start up, depending on temperature, your yeast, your sugars, a whole host of things can actually make a difference. In our situation, usually they start up within a few hours to the first day. But if it doesn't for you, don't worry, give it up to three days. If you start something and it doesn't happen in three days, ask in the comments below and we will help you to make it work. But I'm gonna need the full recipe, everything that you did up to that point. And that way we can we can be able to help you out. Right, because there's some ingredients that do hinder the fermentation process and it may take as much as a week before it really gets going. So please it's off talk already. to us before you do anything drastic. Yes. But for now, this is gonna go sit in our fermentation station for probably a week, maybe two, maybe even three weeks. When I see that airlock activity slow to nearly a stop, we'll be back to show you the next step. Okay, it's been two weeks. Our airlock activity has slowed down to almost nothing. Time to give this its first check. So looking at it, everything looks fine. Okay, I don't see anything growing. There's no eyeballs or, or teeth or anything that are smiling at me. So I think we're safe. I can just barely reach it too, wow. It's not clearing much. That sometimes means it's not done, but not necessarily. And right. I totally it's forgot not, to put my yeah. hydrometer in first. So I'm gonna be very careful putting it in. Hopefully it'll float. Nope. Nope. Okay, with the hydrometer in there, it is reading. Looks like one point. It's reading 1.000 on the nose. Okay. We got a 1.000, now that's considered dry. Some see people say that's done, but here's the thing. It can actually go lower than that because ethanol actually has a 0 0.079 specific gravity. So it is possible that this could go a little bit further. We don't really know. So instead of taking a risk and racking it now, we're gonna pour the sample back in carefully. I'm just gonna tip this on its side a little bit and carefully pour it in. Everything was sanitized, so we don't have to worry about it. And then we're gonna put the airlock back in. And just to be extra sure that there's nothing in there that we don't want, like oxygen and that, I'm gonna give this a swirl. This is not shaking it up. This is just a swirl. And look at that airlock. That's the gases coming out of suspension. The CO2 should push any excess oxygen that might've got in there out, and it should be fine. Plus, it's gonna continue to do that as it sits. It's gonna degas itself and just keep pushing any CO2 out. And because CO2 is heavier than oxygen, as they settle, it'll push the oxygen out first and the CO2 will be left in theory. That said, when you do your swirl, you wanna be careful not to splash so that oxygen goes into the solution, but rather that the gas that's trapped in solution gets pushed out. Exactly. What are we gonna do with this now? We're gonna let this sit for another week and we'll be back then. This has been sitting for about two more weeks. It's time to get its final gravity reading and make sure that it's actually done. It was 1.000 last time. What is it now? Have I mentioned how much I love these new fermenters? I mean, look at that. It's pretty. Speaking of pretty. So is that. That looks like champagne. I know it's not champagne. Can't be champagne. That's why we call it poor man champagne. 
Well, what do you know? 1.000. Okay, it's done. So what we want to do now is we're going to rack it into this pitcher so we know how much we got because I didn't measure before. So remember, we started with 1.5 gallons of grape juice, but then we cooked that grape juice down. Yes. So that's why we have an unknown volume. I'm pouring it into the pitcher because if I pour it in there, I'm likely to disturb, to disturb Lee's and I don't want to do that. Also, there's a tiny little bit left here. I just have to take a taste. <laughs> it smells like wine. That's not half bad. Wow, that's really surprising. For a dry white, that is very surprising from Brian. Yeah. I mean, it, it tastes a little young, but I still got a great flavor. I still got a really nice fruity. Yeah, this is going to be nice. Now that needs to be sanitized because my mouth touched it. My mouth's going to touch it too. I could put more in it. Hmm. It's actually not bad. Yeah. Okay, as we like to do, we're going to use an auto siphon to rack this. And what is racking? Well, Racking is when you take the liquid and you transfer it to a, another vessel, leaving behind the unwanted sediment that has fallen to the bottom. Right. Or in some cases, some additional sediment that's floating on the top. So I'm just going to put this down in. I have the cap on the end because there is a good lees cake at the bottom. And I'm just going to get it started. Trying not to disturb it too much. Is it flowing? It's flowing. Okay. And then let it flow. Okay, we racked it to a pitcher, found out how much we had, then we racked it into a wide mouth one gallon, and put the lid and airlock back on. I took a note. I'm drying it thoroughly. She's drying it thoroughly so I can put the note back on, even though the note... Where he's gonna put it. This note has tape on the side, so it goes on the glass. I didn't do it, she did. <laughs> anyway, so what are we gonna do with this now? We're gonna let it sit. Gonna let it clear out a little bit more, and then we'll be back to show you the next step. Okay, it's been two weeks. It settled out a bit. It cleared up quite a bit, actually. And now we're going to rack it to a pitcher. Why are we racking it to a pitcher? We're racking to a pitcher because we are nearing completion. And we're coming to a stage where we're going to want to add something and mix it thoroughly, thus a pitcher. And there's just a little bit of wispy lease at the bottom, like dust, that I want to get out before we start adding other things to it. Because it's going to end up in a bottle today. All right, so I took the cap off, go halfway down, start the racking process. You've seen this before. Another reason why we use the pitcher is that way we know how much is in it. We're using our handy dandy pitcher with the raised letters. By the way, you can get your very own pitcher in the description of this video. Anyway, we know we have 120 ounces. Now I know that that's four 750 ml bottles and one 16 ounce bottle. So that's what we're gonna prepare so that we are ready for the next stage. Okay, so what we're gonna do with this champagne is we're going to naturally carb or bottle carb or bottle condition, however you wanna call it. What that is is a tiny fermentation in the bottle causing gas, which causes it to be sparkling or a champagne-like product. Can't actually be champagne if you're not in Champagne, France. I don't know, I don't make the rules. So what I have here is the answer to everything. 42 grams of sugar. It's actually one and a half ounces, but it happens to be 42 grams. And that should give a really nice amount of carbonation. I'm going to add it directly to this wine in the pitcher. See, this is why we use the pitcher. Can you add this to some hot water and, you know, get it to melt all in and then add that? Sure, it does dilute your product a little bit. It could prevent a little bit of oxidation. I'm gonna be careful, so it's not that big of a deal to me. This is how we've always done it, and I've never had an issue. You will see recipes that call for putting a teaspoon of sugar in the bottom of each bottle. I really recommend against that because getting that measurement so exact is much more difficult in small quantities like that. The way we're doing it, we can use any size bottle we want and it doesn't really matter because it's all through the whole brew. And we do have one smaller bottle and others that are larger. So. Do you put a teaspoon in the big bottle and not the small bottle? Do you put a half a teaspoon? It just gets a little bit ridiculous. So mix it all in first, then put it in. It'll save you a lot of trouble. That sugar's already pretty much dissolved. It really didn't take long. You do, however, want to make sure that you did mix it thoroughly. Let it settle for a minute and see if there's any grains in the bottom, because you don't want the last bottle to have more sugar than the first bottle. That will be bad. That's the same thing as putting in inconsistent amounts from a teaspoon. The next step. Here's just a couple of our bottles. We're actually gonna be using more. I have a packet of yeast here. This is Lalvin EC1118. This is a champagne yeast. We're using it 
because this is really the purpose it's for, is for carbonating. So all I'm gonna do is rip the package open properly. And I'm just gonna make like a little spout on the package, something like that. If my fingers will work right. And I'm just gonna pour a few grains, just a little bit into each bottle. Now you might be thinking, but didn't you just do all the sugar in the whole thing to keep that consistent? What about yeast? Well, here's the thing. More yeast, less yeast is not going to make this ferment more or less, okay? It's only gonna ferment the sugars that are there and stop. So put in enough that you know it'll ferment it, just, you know, it's probably a quarter teaspoon at most. It might even be an eighth of a teaspoon, just a little bit just to do a fermentation. The reason why I have to add yeast now is because I believe this has been sitting long enough that our initial yeast, they're no more. They're not in here, they went dormant, they got racked away, whatever. So I wanna guarantee we get carbonation. At this point, I'm ready to bottle from here into there, which is just racking with a bottling wand. You've seen us do this before, so we're gonna- We also have a video on that, which I'll make sure to link in the description below. That, see you in a minute. Okay, we bottled. And this is yet another reason why we use that pitcher. I was able to accurately measure and get them all filled properly so that no bottle is too, too low and none are too high. We have just the right number of bottles. These are gonna sit for a couple weeks, probably. We will put them into some sort of container, like either a thick plastic container or a big metal uh, pot or something, just in case there's a flaw in the bottle or anything like that, and they want to explode. We don't want to pull pieces out of walls, cats, People. ourselves, yeah. And never mind the mess that it would make. It just, if you can contain it, all the better. Now I know what you're probably thinking. You're like, you put yeast right in there. I can see them sticking to it. Isn't that gonna create a mess at the bottom of your bottles? Yep. Yes, it absolutely is. Now, if we were a commercial winery that were, was in Champagne region of France, we would have a different method of doing this. Yeah, we do the disgorgement where they freeze where it. Where they and freeze the cap and pop the, it out. And we're, not that. That. we're not doing that. We're not doing that. We're just gonna have some lace in the bottom, so we're gonna pour gently when yeah. it comes time to drink. It's all, it's all good. This will probably take a couple weeks to carbonate. We'll be back then. Poor man champagne. And we're back. Our champagne has been carbonating and it's time to test it. We only left it for about a week and then we pulled one out and put it in the fridge. Let's find out, is it actually carbonated? There should be a little pop. I heard a little, not much, but a little bit. Yeah. We might have pulled it a little soon, but you know what, let's see. Do the fancy pour from the distance. See, look, look at the foam, look at that. <laughs> I'm joking. There is actually some carbonation. Yeah, there, there is totally carbonation. It. It's not overly carbonated. It's not like blow the cork off type of champagne carbonation. Like I said, we probably pulled it a little soon. Yeah, we did. And we know this, but it's okay. So right. clarity, it is pretty darn clear. Yes, it is. I would say that's like a nine and a half on clarity. It's yep. really good. It is very yellow, almost disturbingly so. Yeah. It, it reminds me of a certain... Of a liquid that thing. Yeah. we're not going to talk about. Not something you want to think about carbonating. The aroma is a dry white wine. It smells like champagne. Surprise! It really does. <laughs> it smells kind of like champagne. Wow, it's really hard to get an aroma in a mason jar. <laughs> I barely smell anything. That was a pause for a plane to fly over, because I'm pretty sure that got picked up by the microphones. So... That was a really loud lane. Yeah. All right. Um, spoilers. I may have taken the thumbnail yesterday. Yeah. And because of that, I may have drank a whole glass of this. The, the smaller uh, bottle we opened yesterday. So we knew there was a little carbonation. That's why we decided to go with this today. But um, here we go. Okay. I have to say something here. Yesterday we tried this warm. I did not like it at all. Did not like it, Sam I am. Not one bit. No. Chilled, however, it is enhanced the fruit nice. note somehow. Yeah. I don't it's... know why chilling would do that, but it did. Well, and... chilling took down all the stuff that you don't like and brought up the stuff you do like. Because that's what cold does when you drink something cold versus warm. A lot of compounds and volatile aromas can be turned down. Yeah. Like yesterday, there was a smell. I could smell it. It smelled a little young. It smelled oh. a little footy. Today, I don't really smell it because it's cold and because I'm in a mason jar. And yesterday, there was some funk. There was some dry white wine funk. And I'm saying that in the nicest way possible because of all the things that we make, dry white wine is my least favorite. Right. So we made 
on purpose a dry sparkling white wine. So we're probably going to be uber critical about it because it's not really our thing. However. That said, I could make me some nice cocktails with this poor man's champagne. No I don't problem. even need to make it a cocktail. I could drink this. I could actually drink this. Like put it with food. Chilled with that little bit of sparkling to it. Mm -hmm. It's actually not bad. Wow, I'm mind blown. Who, who Wasn't are you and what did you do? Was with not Ryan? expecting that at all. Whoa! Don't don't knock your glass like that. What did you do? I hit the, I bumped the mason jar and it, it sloshed. splashed on me. Extra slosh. So we'll just we'll just cut all that. Okay, so I mean, I'm gonna be honest. This isn't my most favorite thing that we've ever made. I mean, by far. Not, not even close to my favorite thing. But it's far better than I thought it might be. That said, I would say this is a successful, cheap, yeah. champagne-like well, replicant. Let's look at how much this costs to make. People have been asking a lot lately, well, how much is it per liter or how much is it per bottle? That's a 750 ml bottle. I know we got four of those plus one sixteen ounce, all right? Yep. Okay. The total cost to make this, the, the white grape juice, I want to say, because it was the Publix brand, was like $4.50 a container. We used three. Yep. So that's thirteen dollars and fifty cents. Even if we paid two bucks for the yeast between the two different kind of yeast, we still have some left over from yep. both two. So that's like fifteen to sixteen dollars for five bottles, four and a half bottles, four and two thirds really, of wine. That puts it down to like under four dollars. It's like three dollars and change or two dollars and change per bottle. I mean that's competing with two buck chuck. Yeah. Quality wise, Which, by the way, last time we were at Trader Joe's, is not two bucks. We couldn't find it, yeah. so or it wasn't two bucks anymore. Yeah. Um, quality wise, neither of us are really champagne people. I'll be totally honest. But for a very dry, oh. this is one point zero 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 thirteen percent ish, give or take, with the uh, carbonation in there. Yeah. This is actually not bad, and it's very young. Imagine if this sits for a year; it'll mm -hmm. mellow out. But it has that, there's like a, an acidic bite that you get in champagne. And that's that carbonation and the bite from the, the wine itself. Mm -hmm. It has that. Mm -hmm. It absolutely has that. It's champagne reminiscent. I will say that. It, yeah. Most definitely. I'm, I'm shocked. I mean, I'm not loving this. I'm just in a good mood because like, wow, that worked. I didn't think it was going to be any good. I thought I'm going to sit here and go, this is a three. Nope, this is disgusting. <laughs> I don't like this. It's a three. But it's really not, and it's easily reproducible too. So that leads us to numbers, and mm. are we going to judge this? We're going to do a repeatability. Aware of our bias? Or are we going to? Well, we have a repeatability. Repeatability. First. Okay. Repeatability. I would say no problem. Nine point five. Yeah, just because of the carbonations. The hardest thing is knowing when to stop boiling the juice. <laughs> That's it. That's right, we did that to get the Because you got to boil it down a little bit to, just to get it to the gallon. So if you mark where a gallon is in your pot, start with the gallon and a half, boil it down to the gallon gallon mark, and then cool it, you're fine. So that's why I'm giving it a 9.5 and not a 10. Sure. After that, it was carbonate and bottle. That was it. There, there really wasn't that much to it. Um, we did make some adjustments for acidity, though, I think. Yeah, but yeah, it was, there was, it was... there was definitely some... It, it was easily... Easily done. remedied. No yeah. big deal. So nine, nine and a half. It's it's easy. Let's just put it that way. Anybody could do this. Even a beginner could make this product. Really, really simple. All right. So now on to our personal preference. Are we taking our bias of not really enjoying champagne into consideration? I am looking at it as if someone handed me this beverage and said, what do you think of this? Put a score on it. Oh. I don't even know what it is. So we're keeping biases out. I don't know what it is. I don't even know what, any, no idea what this is. <laughs> well, that's how you, Mystery that's, juice. that's, that's your enjoyability. Mystery juice. It's kind of hard to mentally go back there because we, we know what it is. We know yeah. what it's supposed to be. And I'm excited about how successful it was because I really did think it was going I to be. I do see you, you adding juices to I this will, and making this really good. Yes. I can totally see I that. I see mimosas in my future. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, one thing I do want to point out before we do the scores. Yes, there is still some yeast on the side of the bottle. And yes, there is a decent amount of yeast on the bottom, like a lease on the bottom of the bottle. That's part of the natural carbonation process. And because we had to add more yeast to make sure it carbonated. Yeah. That's why that's there. Yeah. If that really bothers you, well, I'm sorry. You can force carb. Yep, that's about the only carb. way. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So you could do that. Anyway. Champagne on tap. 
our scoring system goes 1 through 10, with the occasional 11 being reserved for those things that are just amazing. This is not one of those, okay? I'll just be honest with you. Anything under a 5, I pretty much probably wouldn't want to drink much at all. Um, from like 5 to 7 or so is considered good. It's it's pretty nice, even up to almost very good. 7.5 and above is your very good to excellent category. So that gives you kind of uh, cutoff points that we like to use. In other words, if we're thinking between a 4.5 to a 5, that's a bigger jump than a 4 to 4.5, because it's a category change. Dun, dun, dun. Yep. That wasn't foreshadowing either. I really don't know what a square I'm going to give it yet. But I'm not hating it. The no, more I'm drinking no, it, the more I'm I... realizing there's a lot of lovely fruity grape mm. notes in it. And that's where I'm, where I'm at. I'm like, this really isn't your thing, but you you drank the whole bottle yesterday, Derica. And it's got a nice acidic bite to it. And then, the, the, you know, that carbonation comes through a little bit. This is, this is better than I expected. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a number yet? I do. All right, I suppose I do too. One, two, three, five point five. Yeah, I'm not surprised that I'm a full point above Brian. Um, I'm surprised I'm above five. But <laughs> to be honest, this this came out a lot better than we were anticipating, and it's certainly successful as a champagne adjacent yeah. beverage thing. Yeah. Uh, it actually has me rethinking champagne, and maybe I want Give it to a try. try champagne again. And hey, you know what? If we do, maybe we can figure out some new things to do and, and those... maybe maybe make a less than poor man's champagne. Yeah, maybe we want to look at champagne again. And those of you in the VIP who were with us on the last Zoom saw that I was drinking a cocktail with champagne in it. That's true, you And were. I didn't ever consider taking tasting the champagne on its own. <laughs> so now I'm regretting that because it would have been a nice... To have that fresh in my mind to compare it to now, but hey, so as soon as we get that TARDIS, so we're gonna leave this for a year, not this one. We have other bottles, we're gonna leave them for a full year, and we'll be back with a tasting at that point to see did this improve after a whole year of aging. But in the meantime, as always, guys, thanks so much for watching and have a great day. Bye bye.